also to our scripture readings this morning, we are reading from Isaiah 25, verses 1 to 12. That's the whole of Isaiah 25. Uh, just a little bit of background. In this, Isaiah is looking to the destruction of Moab, in fact, and its great cities. And then he uh, uses that to, like an analogy of what God will ultimately do to the power of death. And at that time, Moab was, it seemed unbreakable. It seemed like a an enemy who couldn't be touched, and yet uh, it was brought to nothing. And then Isaiah wants to look forward to what God would do through Jesus in doing exactly the same to death. So let's read from Isaiah chapter 25. Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you and praise your name. For in perfect faithfulness, you have done wonderful things, things planned long ago. You have made the city a heap of rubble, the fortified town a ruin, the foreigner's stronghold a city no more. It will never be rebuilt. Therefore, strong peoples will honour you, cities of ruthless nations will revere you. You have been a refuge for the poor, a refuge for the needy in their distress, a shelter from the storm and a shade from the heat. For the breath of the ruthless is like a storm driving against a wall and like the heat of the desert. You silence the uproar of foreigners as heat is reduced by the shadow of a cloud. So the song of the ruthless is stilled. On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats and the finest of wines. On this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever, the Sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces and he will remove his people's disgrace from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. In that day they will say, surely this is our God. We trusted in him and he saved us. This is the Lord we trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. The hand of the Lord will rest on this mountain, but Moab will be trampled in their land, as straw is trampled down in the manure. They will stretch out their hands in it as swimmers stretch out their hands to swim. And God will bring down their pride, despite their cleverness, the cleverness of their hands. He will bring down your high fortified walls and lay them low. He will bring them down to the ground, to the very dust. And then a New Testament reading is from the Gospel of John verses uh, 28 to 37 in chapter 19. So John 19, verses 28 to 37. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. And a jar of wine vinegar was there. So they soaked it in a sponge and put the sponge on a stalk of hyssop plant. They lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now it was the day of preparation. The next day was to be a special Sabbath. Because the Jewish leaders did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it has given his testimony. His testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you also may believe. These things happen so that the scriptures would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And as another scripture says, they will look on the one they have pierced. So today we're going to uh, obviously be um, looking at uh, the, the crucifixion of Jesus and what that means. And uh, it's extraordinary when you read those two passages together and you can see that um, uh, there's a lot going on in this death of Jesus, as we know, because we know that the resurrection took place later on. 
If Jesus was just a martyr and he just died a martyr's death and then that was the end, then we certainly wouldn't be gathering here today. It would have been of very little consequence. There were plenty of people who were would-be messiahs at the time of Christ. In fact, Josephus records at least 12 people, and there are others besides those recorded, who were would-be messiahs, and they all died a martyr's death. They were all crucified, just like Jesus. It's not crucifixion that makes Jesus' death special. It's Jesus that makes the crucifixion special. There were literally tens of thousands of crucifixions in the lifetime of Jesus. Every Jewish child saw people being crucified. That was uh, nothing special about that. It was just, in fact, the cross had a meaning, had a symbolic meaning at the time of Christ, and, and the meaning was, we people in Rome, we're in control, we're ruling. So don't cross us, um, if you'll excuse the pun. But, um, uh, but when Jesus was crucified, he actually overcame that power, and that's what's so significant about it. But in the meantime, we are confronted with death until the resurrection, our own resurrection. We're confronted with death, but we're not left alone. We've got, some, we've got a reason to be hopeful. You know, some years ago, I conducted a funeral for a man who I'd only one year previously known as a groom. Um, I, had, I was privileged to be the celebrant at his wedding, but now I had the sad distinction of also being the minister at his funeral just one year later. Um, and the bride was a girl who had been a member of our congregation for many years, and her wedding day was a joyful and happy celebration. But one year later, there she was in the front row of our church, um, in, you know, in the ghastly thrall of grief, as she was forced to say goodbye to her husband of only one year. Um, only a couple of years later, I married her again to somebody else, so it all turned out well. But, but it, was, it was a tragic day, uh, and it was a terribly sad event. Um, and to be honest, in that moment, I've got to say, I just hated death, hated it with a vehemence. And I was just irritated by it, annoyed by it, and just in that moment, for the sake of that bride, and for, for us all, I guess, I was just... I just hated it. Just the concept of it, the reality of it, everything about it was just horrible. And there's nothing good to say about death. And, uh, and something like that is true in the life of Jesus Christ. Jesus hated death. Well, we're going to see that in just a little while. Uh, and he hated death as if it were almost like a person. And it, and it was almost like he had a personal vendetta against death. Um, indeed, if we closely read the account of Jesus going to the wake of Lazarus after he had died, we soon discover that he hated death in a kind of an almost visceral, emotional way. Uh, in John chapter, 11, I mean, yeah, John chapter 11, when Jesus was confronted with the grief of the friends of Lazarus who, was, who were gathered to mourn his passing, um, it's really interesting the way that the scripture puts it. Let me just read a little bit of that account to you, where uh, in verse 33, now you, you, pretty, you, you know the story of Lazarus where Jesus had been off with his disciples. He'd heard a report that um, Lazarus was, you know, on the point of death, but he could have gone back and healed him. In fact, people were urging him, why don't you go and and do what you do for other people, why don't you go and heal your friend Lazarus? But he deliberately waited until not only was he dead, but he was well dead. I mean, properly dead. And in Jewish speak, if you're dead more than three years, I mean three years, yeah, you're well dead after that. <laughs> but three days, three days dead, because they had this belief that the spirit of a person would hang around for three days just to see if you did a good job of mourning their passing. So you'd hire professional mourners and that sort of thing. But anyway, that's a whole other story. But the point is that Lazarus died and Jesus deliberately waited until after three days that he was dead so that no one could say, oh, he was just a little bit dead. No, he was completely dead. He was dead, 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 fully dead. And, and Jesus did that deliberately because he went there and Jesus always did only what the Father told him to do. He didn't go there speculatively or hopefully or anything. He just went there at the command of his father. And he went there knowing that he was going to raise him from the dead. 
So Jesus wasn't there mourning the passing of his friend, knowing, just like I say, you know, it's all well and good for us to be mournful on Good Friday, but, you know, I kind of think it's out there now. This is old news that Jesus rose from the dead. Anyway, Jesus knew that he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. So, so that the experiences that Jesus was having at the wake of Lazarus was not because he was mourning the passing of Lazarus. We've got to be clear about that. There's something else that's going on. And then he had a conversation with, with uh, Martha and so on. And, um, and then Jesus asked to be taken to the place... Oh, no, sorry. He was talking with Mary in verse 32. And Mary went to Jesus, where Jesus was. Then as soon as she saw him, she knelt down at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And that's absolutely probably true. Verse 33, when Jesus saw that Mary and the people with her were crying, he was terribly upset. Terribly upset. This is the, uh, the contemporary English version of the Bible. Um, in some translations it says he was agitated. But he was terribly upset. What was he upset about? He wasn't upset about the death of Lazarus. He was upset about the effect it was having on Mary and the friends of Lazarus. And then in verse 34 he goes on and said, and he asked, where have you put his body? And they replied, Lord, come and you will see. And Jesus started crying. And again, what was he crying about? Was he crying because he was in grief? And again, I, I want to say, no. Have you ever been so frustrated you've cried? I have. You know, you, you know, nothing works out and everything's going wrong and you get terribly agitated and tears of frustration rolled out. I actually think that's what's going on here for Jesus. If you understand the, the, the meaning of the word uh, where, it's, where it's translated as terribly upset, it has a deeply emotional sense to it and not one of grief but of frustration and of anger and we'll talk about that in a little while but in verse 36 and the people said see how much he loved Lazarus and again they were mistaken in their view some of them said he gives sight to the blind why couldn't he have kept Lazarus from dying and Jesus was still terribly upset <laughs> the same Greek word there again so and that's really interesting so so, in view of this, because of this, therefore, or thusly, that's what that word so could easily be put that way. So, he went to the tomb, which was a cave with a stone rolled against the entrance. And then he told the people to roll the stone away, but Martha said, um, you know that Lazarus has been dead for four days. Like, he's not just dead, he's fully dead. <laughs> and he probably is stinking by now. And as we know, Jesus went on to say, Lazarus, come out, and he was raised from the dead. Now, that's, that's all important that we see that, because what you see here is that Jesus was absolutely hating death at that point. He wasn't in grief for Lazarus, knowing that he was going to raise him from the dead. Um, and and if, you, if we look at some of the other translations of this same passage, in verse 33 in one translation, it says he, gro in, the, in the King James, in fact, it says he groaned in his spirit. Groaned in his spirit. Um, uh, and, and was troubled. There's two different words that are, that are going on there. Um, and then in verse 38, it goes on again and says, therefore Jesus again, groaning in himself, came to the tomb. Now let me um, just look at what those words actually mean. Um, because if we rightly understood, the word groaned here could be used or translated as vehement, vehemently opposed, railed against, or to be critical of someone or something severely or angrily, Indict or to indignantly snort with anger and derision in the act of forbidding someone sternly. Okay, can you see? That, that's what's going on. Jesus is groaning isn't just that he's going, oh, like that. But rather he's going, ah! Oh, I'm so tired of this. I'm so sick of what death does. And he's, and he's vehemently, I hope I'm getting that across, 
annoyed with death. And he wants to sternly rebuke it. And then the next word, troubled, means something like to be perturbed in a state of consternation and contention, unsettled and even angry. So when Jesus wept, he wasn't crying tears of grief. He was crying tears of annoyance and frustration and it was spilling out. He was keeping it all inside as well as he could, but it was coming out of his tear ducts. Um, have you ever seen someone doing that? Anyone who's married would have, no. <laughs> have you ever had to install new software on your computer and it's not working? I was watching my son installing new software on his computer the other day. And, uh, you know, I don't want to um, publicly shame him, but there was a lot of swearing involved. <laughs> I completely understood what he was going through. I'd, just done, I'd used exactly the same software and installed it on my computer not that long ago, and there was a similar amount of uh, frustration. How that expressed itself, I can't remember, but I, I do remember being annoyed. Or have you ever had a reason to uh, be annoyed with an umpire who's clearly in the wrong while you're watching a football game or something? And you just want to go out there and um, encourage them with some, some words of uh, how to judge things differently? Were you calm and collected when that happened? I don't think so. So, um, so Jesus, I believe, if we are to understand the meaning of these words properly, had a similar kind of understanding and feeling towards death and what it was doing to the people around him. I mean, death is, after all, it's horrible. It's just horrible. There's nothing good to say about death. It's, it wrecks everything. It ends marriages and families and friendships and partnerships and fellowships. It makes a mockery of all human ambitions. It crushes our hopes to dust. And no one in history has ever stood successfully against it. So, yeah, you have every reason in the world to be annoyed with death. The prophet Isaiah, in the passage we read out in Isaiah 25 and verse 7, he describes death as a shadow over humanity, a shadow that brings disgrace and reproach to our humanity in verse 8. And, uh, but, but even there, in the long-range view of Isaiah, as he looked forward to the coming of the Messiah, he believed that the day would come when he, that is God, will swallow up death forever, just as God destroyed the Moabite um, hegemony, he's going to destroy the hegemony of death. And the Lord will then wipe away all the tears, not just from the Jewish people, but from all faces. And he's going to, he's going to, to put forward a feast of the best food and the best wine on Mount Zion. And again, not just for the Jews, but for the whole world. And it was, as I've been saying all along, everything that God did for the Jews, wasn't just for the Jews, but through the Jews for the world. And the ultimate fulfilment of that, as Isaiah would say in many other places, was one day a great king will arise, he'll be the Messiah, the one chosen by God to achieve all of this. And so he takes the story of Moab and then translates that to the story of what God will do with death. Um, and so, um, and similarly, in the story of Lazarus, Jesus has this contempt for death. And because he's so annoyed with it, it's, he turns to, to Mary and says, take me to the tomb. Let's get this over with, almost. That's what he's saying. He was not what you'd call composed at that point. He, I mean, Jesus is, is an emotional human being. We forget that sometimes. He didn't float around on a cloud. He was affected by the people around him, the things he saw. And he was affected by his love for us, but he was also affected with anger. Anyone who loves someone will be angry with the thing that's going to destroy the one they love. If someone came into my house to harm my children, I have no qualms in saying that they'd be, either I'd be dead real quick or that they would be dead before they hit the floor. 
Because I'm motivated. I'm an emotional person. And Jesus is motivated and he's experiencing deep, troubling, agitating feelings at this point because of what death is doing to his friends and what it's done to Lazarus and what it's doing to the whole human race. And so, and so, therefore, Jesus went to the tomb. And it almost seems like he was keen to land a punch on the face of death as a foreshadowing of his ultimate victory over death on the cross and in his own vicarious resurrection, which he did for all humanity. He wanted to rough death up a bit before the big event. So at the tomb of, of Lazarus, Jesus snatches one soul from the jaws of death, but it was only a temporary reprieve. You know, poor old Lazarus died twice. I would have thought one death per person is enough, but not in, not in Lazarus' case. The ultimate victory would come later when at last Jesus cries out on the cross, as we read in the Gospel of John, it is finished. And those words are are powerful. You know, many things finished in that moment, such as the race that Jesus had run, a, a race of faithfulness, a full human life where every step in the race he took, he didn't stumble once. No human being has ever done that. From Adam onwards, human beings have tried to run a race of obedient faithfulness to God, to offer God a life that is perfect, and none of us gets out of the gates hardly before we stumble. But Jesus has face down every testing, every temptation, every reason to, to, um, to go it alone, to say no to his father. But in every circumstance, even in the Garden of Gethsemane, even after the 40 days fast, he faces down every temptation and he has completed a perfect, a perfect response to God. And with it, because of that, death is also finished, brought to an end. In fact, as uh, that same passage in John 19 is translated in the contemporary English version, it has it this way. Jesus knew that he had now finished his work. He finished the job he came to do. And in order to make the scriptures come true, he said, I'm thirsty. A jar of cheap wine was there. Someone soaked it in a sponge with the wine and held it up to Jesus' mouth on a stem of hyssop plant. And after Jesus drank the wine, he said, everything is done. In fact, in the Greek, you could actually perfectly translate it with the word perfectly. It is perfectly complete, would be another way to put it. It is completely and perfectly accomplished. And then he bowed his head and he died. But he didn't die as a victim. He died as a victor. He defeated death by entering into the burning building of our fallen humanity and letting that fire consume him, but he never experienced corruption. He experienced temptation without ever sinning. He experienced uh, uh, despair without giving up hope. And he experienced death without over being overcome by corruption. And in the moment that Jesus died, that was not the victory of death, it was the victory of Christ. Jesus Christ absorbed and destroyed death in his own body. Sin and death and all the evil that comes with it and all the hopelessness and despair and the broken relationships and, the, and all the things that death entails, that whole pall of evil was drunk down into the, into the body of Jesus Christ, but he overcame it. The power of his connection to God the Father was greater than the disconnecting power of death and the jaws of death had all its teeth broken on the life of Christ. So that Jesus was able to say, anyone who believes in me, even though they physically, biologically die, yet will they live with the Zoe life of God, the real life of God that will outlast your physical death. Even Lazarus had to face biological death twice but Lazarus is now entered into the eternal unending life in Jesus Christ and one day he together with us 
will follow Jesus in the resurrection. The resurrected body of Jesus is the prototypical uh, first fruits of the life to come, of the resurrected, renewed earth. The first clue to that, the first inkling of that, the first shining of the light coming from the world to come is in the physical resurrected body of Jesus. And one day you're going to pass through death just like Jesus did, just like Lazarus is, that together with Lazarus we will stand up, not just in biological life but in eternal life, to live on earth forever and ever and death will be no more. Our tears will be wiped away from our faces. And it's going to begin with a feast on the mountain of the Lord with the finest of food and the finest of wine. That's something to look forward to. The wedding feast of the Lamb. So, death is undone. It is finished. Amen.